Hi guys. I am on chapter five of Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. And the last time we read, we talked about how Melody had just gotten introduced to someone that would tell her mom how smart she is. And they determined she was not smart, which was based on no evidence, but no evidence of actual how, how much is in Melody's head. So uh, let's get started on chapter five, where she's been in school for five years. She went there in kindergarten, and now she's in fifth grade. So do you think, I hope someone's figured out how smart she is. I have been at Spalding Street Elementary School for five years. It's very ordinary, filled with kids, just like the schools I see on television shows. Kids who chase each other on the playground and run down the hall to get their dust before the bell rings. Kids who slide on icy patches in the winter and stomps in puddles in the springs. Kids who shout and push. Kids who sharpen their pencils, go to the board, do math problems. Kids who write their answers in their notebook paper. Kids who throw food at each other in the cafeteria. Kids who sing in the choir learn to play the violin and take gymnastics or ballet or something fun swimming lessons kids who shoot baskets in gym their conversation fills the halls as they make plans make jokes make friends kids who for the most part ignore kids like me the special needs bus they call it as a cool wheelchair lift built in the door and it picks me up every morning in front of my house when we get to school, the driver takes their time and makes sure all the belts and buckles are tight before they lower all of us with walkers or wheelchairs or crutches or helmets uh, down from the bus lift one by one to the ground. Then an aide will roll with us or help us walk over to the waiting area. Whether the weather is bright and sunny, we sit outside. Oh, sorry. When the weather is bright and sunny, we sit outside and play uh, the school. I watch regular kids as they play Foursquare while they wait for the bell to ring. They look like they're having fun. They ask one another to play, but no one's ever asked any of us. Not that we could play with them anyways, but it would be nice if someone just said hi. I guess the four square players must think we're all so backward that we don't care if we're treated like we're invisible. I was so excited when mom first enrolled me here. I thought I'd learn new things every day, but mostly it was, sorry, but mostly it was simply something to do that took up time to get me out of the house. In second and third grades, I probably learned more from the sci-fi or discovery channels that I ever learned in school. My teachers were nice, most of them, but they would have needed x-ray vision or Superman to see what was inside my head. I am in a special program with other children with what they call disabilities. Our age ranges from nine to 11. Our learning community, what a joke, has been together ever since I started cool kindergarten. We never seem to move up and on in other classes like everyone else. We just do what we did the year before, but with sometimes a new teacher comes. We don't even get a new classroom each year. We're in the same classroom. So the same kids I'm with now were together in second grade with a teacher named Miss Tracy. As third graders, we suffered through Mrs. Bullops, who could have gotten an award for the worst teacher in the world. There are six self-contained learning communities in our wing of the building. Children with various conditions, from preschoolers to kids who ought to be in high school by now. Our classroom, room H5, might be nice for babies, but give me a break. It's painted yellow and pink. One wall is covered with sun and happy face, a huge rainbow, and dozens of flowers with smiley faces. The other wall is painted with happy bunnies, kittens, and puppies. Bluebirds fly all over the sky with a perfect white cloud. Even the birds are smiling. I think I've got a puke. Ashley, the youngest in our group, actually does puke quite a bit. She's nine, but she could pass for three. 
She has the smallest wheelchair I've ever seen. She's our fashion model. She is just plain beautiful. Movie star eyes, long curly hair, tiny pixie nose. She looks like a doll you see in a box on a shelf, except she's even prettier. Her mother dresses her in a perfectly matching outfit every day. If she has on pink shirt, she wears pink slacks, pink socks, two tiny pink bows in her hair. Even her little fingernails have been done pink to match. When we do uh, what the teachers and therapists called group activities, it's hard for Ashley to participate. Her body is really stiff and it's tough for her to reach or grab or hold anything. Every Christmas, they make the kids in age five decorate a stupid six foot tall styrofoam snowman. I don't know what the children in regular classrooms get to do, but I know it's close to holiday time when every they when every uh when each year the teacher pulls out this thing from the closet. Mrs. Hyatt, the kindergarten teacher, loved that messed up snowman. Just three huge balls of yellowing styrofoam stuck together with pins and pipes. Let's decorate, children, she said in her squeaky, annoying voice. We're going to do, we're going to place decorations with Velcro or toothpicks or glue, whatever works, on Sydney, our H5 holiday snowman. I don't know how the sto- how old the snowman was at this point, but poor Sydney could not stand up straight at all. It leaned like a drunk who needed the wall to hold up. Mrs. Hyatt gave us green snowflakes. Green? We were the dumb kids. I guess we weren't supposed to care. Brown garland, stars that were purple and pink. Do you like the snowman, Ashley? Mrs. Hyatt asked her. It's almost impossible for Ashley to communicate because her body is so tight. Her talking board has just two words on it, yes and no. She turned her head slightly to the left for no, she didn't like the snowman. I bet she wished she could knock the thing down. Compared to Ashley, Carl is huge. He's, even he's got, uh, even though he's just nine, he's got a special wheelchair that's extra wide and it takes two aids to lift him in and out of it. But he's good with his hands. He can move his own chair and he can hold a pencil well enough to write his name and stab a snowman. Carl sticks pencils and rulers into a snowman's torso and pens into his head. Miss Hyatt used to clap on her hands and squeaky little voice. Good job, Carl. So creative. Carl would just laugh. He can talk, but only in very short sentences. Usually only have two parts like snowman dumb. He'd yell. Very dumb. He'd think he hates snowman just as much as I do. One year, he pinned a diaper on the back of another and another on the bottom of the front of the snowman. The teacher let him stay. Carl knows his diapers. When he poops in his pants, which is almost every day, the whole room smells like a monkey house in the zoo. The aides are so patient with him, though. They snap on their rubber gloves to clean him up, change his clothes. He always wears sweats, and they sit him back in his chair. The aides deserve medals. We're not an easy bunch. Maria, who has Down syndrome, she's 10. She loves Christmas, Easter, and Valentine's Day, and Earth Day. It doesn't matter. If it's a holiday, she loves it. Maria is ready to celebrate. She's wide around the middle, a little like our snowman, but Maria talks all the time. She's fun to be around, even though she insists on calling me Melly Belly. Every year, when it's time to bring out the ancient snowman, Maria jumps and cheers, real excited. I'm pretty sure she's the only kid in our class who actually likes it. It's time for Sydney the snowman, she gasps. Can I put his hat on? Please, please. Can I give him his red scarf? Sydney will love my red scarf. Miss Hyatt and every teacher after her always let Maria take charge of the green paper cut out candy canes and the purple stars cut from wrapping paper. Maria kissed each decoration before attaching them to the snowman with Velcro. She hugs Sydney each afternoon before she goes home. She cries every time it's time to put Sydney away for the year. Even though she has trouble figuring out complicated stuff, 
Maria understands people and how they feel. Why are you sad today, Melly Belly? She asked one morning a couple years ago. How could she have known that my goldfish had died the day before? I let her give me a big hug, and I felt better. If Maria is our hugger, Gloria is our rocker. She rocks for hours in the corner, under one of those dumb, smiling flowers. The teachers are always trying to coax her out, get her to stop, but she wraps her arms around herself like she's cold, and she keeps rocking. She's autistic, I think. She can walk perfectly well, and she talks like she has something to say. It's always worth listening to. Snowman makes me shiver, she blurted out one day uh, when the classroom was surprisingly quiet. Then she curled up in her corner and said nothing else until it was time to go home. She never added one decoration to our snowman. She does like she but she does uncurl and seem to relax a little when they put the holiday music on. Willie Williams, yes, that's really his name, is 11. I'm not sure what his diagnosis is. He yodels like one of those Swiss people in the commercial for like cop drops. Um, he makes other noises too. Whistles, grunts, shrieks. He's never ever quiet and he never completely still. I sometimes wonder if he makes all those noises and movements in his sleep. When Sydney the snowman comes out of whatever box they keep him in during most of the year, the teacher has to keep Willie at a distance because he'll knock that wobbly thing down. Willie's not trying to be mean or anything. He just can't keep his arms and legs still. He can't help it. Mrs. Wyatt was the first teacher to witness Sydney topple over. Why don't you... Add this bright pink bow to our snowman, she had squeaked to Willie the first year. All arms in movement, Willie tried, but the stupid pink bow went in one direction and poor Sydney went in the other direction. Three separate balls rolled across our room. Willie shrieked and whistled, and I thought I even saw him smile for a little bit. Now, if Mrs. Hyatt had given Willie, Willie a baseball to glue to the snowman, it would have been placed more carefully. Willie loves baseball. Our first grade teacher, Mr. Gross, Mr. Gross, <laughs> liked to play guessing games. Willie just barbled if the question were about butterflies or boats, but watch out if the question was about baseball. He'd screech out the right answer and yelp and bellows. Oh. Who was the first baseball player to hit 60 home runs in one season? Mr. Gross asked. Babe Ruth! Then with a screech. Who broke Babe Ruth's record of 714 home runs? <gasps> Hank in! Whooping noises. And who was the all-time hit king? Mr. Gross seemed to be astonished with Willie's knowledge. P. Rose! P. Rose! Four, two, five, six, E, E! And who holds the lifetime touchdown record? Silence. Not even a squeak. Willie doesn't bother with football or snowmen. Sometimes when I look at Willie, though, I get the feeling like he really wishes he could be still and silent. I watch him as he closes his eyes, frowns up his face and concentrates. For just a few minutes, he's quiet. He takes a deep breath, like a swimmer coming up for air. And when he opens his eyes, the noises start all over. And then he always just looks sad. Jill uses a walker because her left foot drags a little when she walks. She's thin and pale and quiet. When Sydney comes out for the season, Jill's eyes are almost blank. It's like the light had been clicked off. She cries a lot. Mr. Gross used to put decorations in her hand and make her... Uh, to make it easier for her to join the activity, but it was like helping a mannequin at a store. I heard an aide say that she was in a car accident when she was a baby. I think that's awful to start out okay and then lose the ability to do stuff. Freddie, who's almost 12, is the oldest in our group. He uses an electric wheelchair. He loves that thing. Every time He tells me every time he can, Freddie, go zoom! Freddie, go zoom! He grins, pretends he's putting on a helmet, 
and then pushes the controller in the max position and takes off across the room. Of course, his speed control has two settings, slow and slower. But to Freddy, he's at the racetrack. He zooms his electric chair around the raggedy old snowman, tossing velcroed stars and bells at it, saying, snowman, go zoom. Well, after Willie sent it flying, Carl tried to stab it with pencils. Uh, I guess it's a fair question. Can snowman go flying? Can snowman go zoom? Every year, Freddy adds his own touch to the snowman, NASCAR, and NASA decals like the one on his chair. If you ask Freddy what date it is, he can't tell you. But he, but if you want to know who won the Daytona 500, Freddy will know. And then there's me. I hate that stupid snowman. But I toss tinsel at it like they tell me to. It's easier than trying to explain. I have a large plexiglass tray that fastens to the arms of my chair. It serves as a food tray as well as a communication board. When I was younger, mom pasted dozens of words on it, but I was still limited to only a handful of common nouns, verbs, adjectives, some names, and a bunch of smiley faces. There are also a few necessary phrases like, I need to go to the bathroom, please, and I'm hungry. But most people, even little kids, need to say more than I need to go to the bathroom and I'm hungry. Duh. I've got please, thank you, yes, no, maybe, close together on the right-hand side of the tray. On the left are the names of people in my family, kids in my class, and the teachers. The name Sydney is not included. There's an alphabet strip at the top so I can spell out words and a row of numbers under that so I can count or or say how many, or talk about time, but for the majority of my life, I've had the communication tools of a little kid on my board. It's no wonder everybody thinks I'm retarded. I hate that word, by the way, it says that. I hate that word, retarded. I hate that word too. Ugh, it gives me, I hate it. I like all the kids in the room H5, and I understand their situation better than anybody else, but there's nobody else like me. It's like I live in a cage with no door and no key, and I have no way to tell someone how to get me out. Oh wait, I forgot about Miss V. Chapter six. Mrs. Violet Valencia lives next door to us. Violets are purple and Valencia's Valencia oranges are, well, orange. Purple oranges are just plain unusual, and so is she. She's a big woman, about six feet tall, with the biggest hands I've ever seen. They're huge. I bet she could pull out, a, she could put a full-size basketball in each one of her palms and still have room left over. If Mrs. V is, well, like a tree, then my mom is like a twig next to her. I was about two years old when I first started hanging out with Mrs. V. Mom and Dad hardly left me with anybody at first, but sometimes their work schedules overlapped and they needed a third person to help out. Mom said Mrs. V was a first time visitor when I first came home to the hospital. Mrs. V was the very first visitor, sorry, when I first came home from the hospital. The first person to just pick me up like any other baby a lot of my parents' friends have been scared to even touch me, but not Mrs. V. Mrs. V wears huge, flowing dresses. Must be miles of material in those things, all in crazy color combinations. Bubblegum pink, fire engine red, peach sorbet, and bright cinnamon. And all shades of orange and purple, of course. She told me she makes her dresses herself. I guess she'd have to. I have never seen anything like them in a store or a hospital either. Mrs. V and Mom used to work together as nurses at the hospital. Mom told me the children there had been crazy about her. She wore the same bright outfit in the preemie ward, the kids' cancer ward, and the children's burn unit. Color brings life and hope to these children, 
she announced boldly, daring anybody to disagree. No one ever did. I remember sitting on Miss, Mrs. V's porch the very first time. Mom and Dad looked concerned, but Mrs. V held me tight and I bounced on her knees. She must have had a hidden microphone under those flowing clothes. She has one of those voices that can make anybody shut up, turn, and listen. Of course I'll watch Melody, she said with certainty. Well, Melody is, well, you know, really special, Dad said hesitantly. All kids are special, Mrs. B replied with authority. But this one has hidden superpowers. I'd love to help her find them. We can't possibly pay you for what this is worth for us. I'll appreciate whatever you can give me, Mrs. V said. My dad looked sheepishly. Well, thanks, and, and I'll get that ramp finished this weekend. I just need to make one more trip to the lumberyard. Now that will be a big help, Mrs. V said. Melody can be a handful, Mom had it warned. Mrs. V lifted me into the air, but I've got big hands. I want her to reach her highest potential, Dad added. Oh, gag me, Mrs. V said. Don't get bogged down in all those touchy-feeling words and phrases you read in a disabled kid's book. Melody is a child who can learn and will learn if she sticks with me. Dad looked embarrassed, but then he grinned. I'll bring her back in 20 years. Or she said, he said to Mrs. V, bring her back in 20 years. You'll have her home by supper time. So most work days, I'd end up at Mrs. Valencia's place for a couple of hours until mom and dad could get home. When I got older, I went over to Mrs. V every afternoon after school. I don't know how much they paid her, but it couldn't have been enough. From the very beginning, Mrs. Valencia gave me no sympathy. Instead of sitting me in a special little chair like my parents bought for me, she plopped me down in the middle of the floor on a large, soft quilt. The first time she did that, I looked up at her like she was crazy. I cried. I screeched. Ah, she ignored me. Walked away and flipped on her CD player. Loud marching band music th soared through the whole home. I liked it. Then she came back and put my favorite toy, a rubber monkey, a few inches from my head. I wanted that monkey. It squeaked when you touched it. I screamed louder. Mrs. V sat down the quit. Turn over, Melody. She sat quietly. Sometimes she made her voice really soft. Turn over. I was shocked. I stopped yelling. I couldn't turn over. Didn't you know that? Was she nuts? She wiped my nose with a tissue. You can turn yourself over, Melody. I know you understand every word I say to you, and I know you can do this. Now roll. Actually, I'd never bothered to try very hard to roll anywhere. I'd fallen off the sofa a couple times, and it hurt, so I usually just waited for Mom and Dad to move me. Look at how you're lying. You're already on your side, halfway there. Use all that screaming and hollering energy you've got. Take yourself to another position. Toss your right arm over and concentrate. So I did. I strained. I'd reached. I tried so hard. I farted. <laughs> Mrs. V cracked up, but suddenly, slowly, slowly, not suddenly, sorry, slowly, slowly, I felt my body rolling, and then, unbelievably, plop, I was on my stomach. I was so proud of myself, I screeched. I told you so, Mrs. V said. Now go get that monkey. I knew better than to protest, so I reached for it. The monkey was now only two inches from my hand, and I tried to scoot. My legs kept doing the opposite of what my head wanted them to do. I wiggled, I grabbed a fistful of quilt, and I pulled. The monkey got closer. You are a smart little cookie, Mrs. B said. I gave the, monk the quilt another tug, and finally, gradually, I had the monkey in my hand. I clutched it and squeaked it as if it were glad to see me. I grinned and made it squeak again and again. After that workout, you must be hungry, she said. She felt fed me a vanilla milkshake and then my vegetables and noodles. Miss Valencia always served dessert first, 
And I always eat all my food, the healthy part and the yummy part too. It's our secret. Mrs. B is the only person who lets me drink soda, Coke, Sprite, Tahitian treat. I love all those nose tickling burps. Mom and dad mostly just give me milk and juice. Mellow yellow is my favorite. Mrs. V even started calling me that. <laughs> At Mrs. V's house, I learned to scoot and then to crawl. I'd never win a baby crawling contest, but by the time I was three, I learned to get across a whole room. She made me figure out how to flip myself over from front to back and back to front again. She was tough on me. She'd let me fall out of my wheelchair onto pillows so I wouldn't hurt myself, and I'd learn how to catch myself best. Suppose somebody forgets to fasten that seatbelt of yours, she said in a voice that sounded like chewing gravel. Hmm. You better know what to do, or you'll just bust your head wide open. I didn't want a busted head, so we practiced. She sent me home, tell mom that I had a good dinner and a good poop. I had no idea why parents think it's so important to have a good poop. Then she'd wink at me, like it was our secret mission. Once I started school, however, I discovered I had a much bigger problem than just falling out of my chair. I needed words. How was I supposed to learn anything if I couldn't talk? How was I supposed to answer questions or ask questions? I knew a million words, but I couldn't read a book. I had a million thoughts in my head, but I couldn't share them with anybody. On top of that, people didn't really expect the kids at age five to learn much anyone. Anyways, it was driving me crazy. I couldn't have been much more than six when Mrs. V figured out what I needed. One afternoon after school, after a snack of ice cream and caramel sauce, she flipped through the cable channels and stopped at a documentary with some guy named Stephen Hawking. Now I'm interested in almost everything that has a wheelchair in it. Duh, I even like Jerry Lewis Telethon. Turns out Stephen Hawking has something called ALS, and he can't walk or talk, and he's probably the smartest man in the world, and everybody knows it. That is so cool. I bet he gets frustrated sometimes. After the show went off, I got real quiet. He's sort of like you, isn't he? Mrs. V asked. I pointed to yes on my board, then pointed to no. I don't follow you, she scratched her head. I pointed to need on my board, then to read. Need, read, need, read. I know you can read lots of words, Melody, Mrs. V said. I pointed again. More, 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 more. I could feel tears coming. Melody, if you had to choose, which would you rather be able to do? Walk or talk? Talk. I pointed to my board. I hit the word again and again. Talk, talk, talk. I have so much to say. So Mrs. V made it her new mission to give me language. She ripped all the words off my communication board and starts from scratch. She made new words smaller so they could fit, more words could fit. Every single space on my talking board got filled with names and pictures of people in my life, questions I might need to ask, and a big variety of nouns and verbs so I could actually compose something that looked like a sentence. I could ask, where is my book bag? Or I could say, happy birthday, mom, just by pointing with my thumb. I have magical thumbs, by the way. They work perfectly. The rest of my body is sort of like a coat with buttons done up in the wrong holes. But my thumbs came out with no thaw, no flaws, no glitches, just my thumbs. Go figure. Every time Miss V would add new words, I learned them quickly. Used them in sentences, and I was hungry for more. I wanted to read. She, so she made flashcards, pink for nouns, blue for verbs, green for adjectives. Piles and piles of words. I learned to read. Little words like fish, dish, swish. I like to rhyme with words. They're easy to remember, rhyming words. It's like buy one, get the rest free. 
the sale at the mall. I learned big words like caterpillar and mosquito. And I learned words like knock and gnome. I learned the days of the week, the months of the year, all the planets, continents, oceans. Every single day, I learned new words. I sucked them in and gobbled them up like they were Mrs. V's cherry cake. But then she would stretch out the word cards on the floor, position me in a big pillow so I could reach them, and I'd push the cards into sentences with my fists. It was like stringing the beads of a necklace together to make something really cool. I liked that I made her laugh, so I'd put words together in wacky order sometimes. Blue fish will run away. He does not want to be dinner. She also taught me words for all the music I'd heard at home. She learned to tell the difference between Beethoven and Bach, between a sonato and a concerto. She'd pick a selection on a CD and then ask me, uh, and then ask me the computer, the composer, sorry, Mozart. I'd point to the correct card from the choices she set in front of me. Huh? She asked. When she heard a selection from Bach, I'd point to the correct composer, and then once again, to color, uh, touch the color blue on my board. I also touched purple. She looked confused. I search around for the right words, try to explain what I meant. I wanted to tell her that music was colorful when I heard it. I finally realized that even Mrs. V couldn't figure out what everything was going on in my head. We kept going. Sometimes she'd play hip hop music, sometimes oldies, Music, the colors it produced, flowed around her as easily as her clothing. Mrs. V took me outside in all kinds of weather. One day, she actually took me out and let me sit outside in the rain. It was steaming hot and it was sticky and I was irritable. It must have been about 90 degrees outside. We were sitting on her porch, watching the storm clouds gather. She told me the names of all the clouds and made up stories about them. I knew that later she'd have the names of every kind of cloud on the word cards for me. Big old Nimbus up there. He's black and powerful. He can blow all the other clouds out of the sky. And he wants to marry Miss Cumulus Cloud. But she's too soft and too pretty to be bothered with the scary guy. So he gets mad and he makes storms, she told me. Finally, old Nimbus got his way. And the rain came down around me like Mrs. V. It rained hard. I couldn't see past the porch. The wind blew and the wet coolness of the rain washed over me. It felt good. A small leak on Mrs. V's porch let a few drops of rain fall on my head. I laughed out loud. Mrs. V gave me a funny look and then hopped up. You want to feel it all? She asked. I nodded my head. Yes. She rolled me down the ramp Dad had built, both of us getting wetter and wetter every second. She stopped when we got to the grass and let the rain drench us. My hair, my clothes, my eyes, my arms, and my hands. Wet, wet, wet. It was awesome. The rain was warm, almost like bath water. I laughed and laughed. Eventually, Mrs. V rolled me back up the ramp into the house where she dried me off, changed my clothes, and gave me a little cup of chocolate milk. She dried off my chair, and by the time Dad came to pick me up, the rain had stopped and everything was dry once more. I dreamed of chocolate clouds all night. All right, we're going to stop at the end of Chapter 6, and I want you to think about all of those teachers that Melody has, the ones from kindergarten, uh, Miss Hyatt, Mr. Gross, and Mrs. V. And I want you to think about who are the teachers in your life that kind of match those personalities.